Hey, Jonathan, how are you? Grant, I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having me. How yeah, are you? Man. I'm doing great, man. It's, uh, as you know, you and I, um, we're talking a little bit before the show and, you know, it's been a long week. We're at the very end of the week. So I'm, I'm I can see the finish line right now. So, um, and having you at the finish line is, is, is pretty cool. So I'm really excited to have you on the show. We're going to talk about adversity. You know, you and I both have dealt with a lot of adversities and, and we both work with, um, with student athletes. So we're going to dive deep in, into your story, adversity, and how you actually work with student athletes and what you're doing, you know, as a motivational speaker and your podcast and all these great things. So I'm, I'm really excited to have you share your, your mindset and your journey today. Definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here and excited for the opportunity just to share. All right. So let's get into it. Let's, this is my favorite part of the, the show, starting it off with mental toughness. So when you think about the word or words, mental toughness, what does that mean to you? Mm, that's a great question to kick off. <laughs> so, so when I think of mental toughness, the first thing that I just think of is just go, going, well, I, I'll just give you a definition. I'll, I'll just shoot it straight. So the first thing I think of is just like that crunch time. If it's crunch time at the end of the game or crunch time when it's finals and how that stress is riding high, but still you still have to go out there and you still have to perform. So that's what I think of in regards to mental toughness. Beautiful. And, and I know that you played, you played football, you're an athlete, still an athlete, but was there, is there a time when you reflect as an athlete or even right now as an entrepreneur uh, where you had to be like a specific time where you had to be very mentally tough in the moment? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, so Grant, you, you really, you really dug up, you really dug up some bones because I played, I played football like middle school and I tried in high school and that's uh that probably would be the time where I had to dig up some mental toughness um, and facing adversity because I would, I quit, I quit the team mm -hmm. and this is, this is the tail end. And I told the coaches like, I quit. I was like, I'm done. My dad was like, why don't you just finish out the season? So I went out there and it was almost like a switch was flipped in my head. And from that, when that switch got flipped, then I, I started turning it on and I started to get better as I was getting ready to quit. I guess I want to end on a high note. Um, there you but go. before that, <laughs> everything was downhill and it was all bad. So that would be a time where um, there was adversity. That would be a time where I didn't really understand the game, but still I just, you know, locked in and just doubled down and said, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to finish out strong. And so I love that finishing out strong, especially when maybe you're not necessarily 100% connected to what mm -hmm. you're doing, but you know what, you've committed. Um, and I've been around a lot of coaches and I've actually had a, uh, an honor to, to work with this one high school coach where he doesn't let any of his players quit. So if you start, mm -hmm. if you come to practice on the first day and he shares that with the parents, if your son steps on my field on the first day in summer, then he cannot quit. And if he does quit, then I'm actually going to be at your front door blaming you. That's what wow. he says. So he holds them accountable. If you're going to commit to this, then you've got to see it through. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a little harsh and a little aggressive, but it's also, it teaches you a, an incredible life lesson. So wow. it, it's pretty cool that, you know, that you saw it through, even though it was probably un uncomfortable. So mm -hmm thinking about when you were a student athlete and this is what you do now you're in the business of helping student athletes thrive share with my listeners kind of what you do with student athletes in your business and and what you're seeing right now with student athletes definitely so i, f I like to focus on three main pillars uh, it would be the personal development professional development and, and then the mental health aspect of it all and i what, what i what i go in and I always do i I always, you know, get with the director, get with the program coordinator, whoever it might be. And I always like to assess just the situation, like, like where, where's the area of opportunity? What would you like to see improve? And, and, and from there, then, you know, we go out and, and then we determine what program makes the most sense or how can we best serve these, these student leaders? If, if it be, you know, some one-on-one -on -one sessions, if it be going in and, and doing group workshops and, and things like that, but really helping them to navigate with with identity outside of their sport because we, we, we we've all heard it said grant the ball is going to stop bouncing but what are you going to do after that right so helping them begin to identify what passions they have what skill set that they can begin to cultivate 
parallel to them still competing as a student athlete. Um, and then that'll set them up for success long term. And then, of course, that that mental health piece, you, you, you know, Grant, you, you know, you know better than I do. Yeah. Um, but but just when it comes to, to mental wellness and and just mental toughness, there, there are so many strategies um, that we need to first identify and then make sure they know how to implement them. And then when they see a strategy for success, just like you said before, you have to they have to make sure they implement it and then continue to implement it, continue to make sure you understand yeah. I'm seeing success with this. This is decreasing anxiety. This is decreasing stress. So let me do more of this so that I'll continue to get the benefits. So I, I, I typically do that with colleges um, and, and, and athletic programs, just helping them navigate uh, just, you know, through this time and beyond. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, when I was younger, and I, and I think we see it now, um, we're seeing a lot more resources and mm -hmm. mental health is, I believe it's, it's on top of mind right now. And I think there's a lot of, you know, the NFL is doing a really good job, NBA is doing a really good job of, of um, putting a lot of emphasis in education and providing information about mental health and providing resources. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I was playing sports uh, that was a long time ago but we didn't have resources we weren't talking about transitioning out of um of sport and what the effects were of of actually transitioning out and dealing with identity issues which i had to deal with we talked about leadership but we weren't really there wasn't a lot of resources out there to provide leadership skills so you know because you're doing it, I think it's awesome. Like it's, it's a beautiful thing that you're doing this, but what was, what motivated you to step up and, and provide these services to high schools and also to colleges? Well, it, it, it was ultimately the, the beauty of the struggle, right? Uh, um, because earlier when we were talking about just mental toughness and adversity, after graduating, Grant, I was doing everything from delivering phone books door to door, and nobody even knows what a phone book is anymore, in Texas heat, <laughs> to tossing off wheels with rims within the wheel off the back of FedEx trucks. I was just trying to figure it out. I, I was trying to find my place in the world. Um, and, and honestly, Grant, I ran for so long from working with student athletes. At first, I was like, no, I don't want to work with student athletes. I don't know why initially I didn't want to and why I ran from it. I was like, I'm just going to speak to students. And then I'd get an engagement here, get an engagement a couple months down the line. And there really wasn't any consistency. <clears throat> but um, just bringing it full circle, <clears throat> then, I, then I got to the place to where I began to realize, Jonathan, you struggled in transition. There are other students who are either going through a similar struggle or going through a struggle that you potentially could help them by sharing your story, by helping some tools, by helping strategy, sharing strategy and resources. So why not do that? So ultimately, the, my, my goal is just to help people not make the same mistakes I did. And, and then other than that, setting them up for success so they can reach back and do it for the group coming after them, the next yeah. group and the next group. Yeah. It's about being in service, right? And it's a, uh... It's, it's a beautiful thing when you're in service, you can feel the frequency of it, right? But then when you get to mm -hmm. teach people how to be in service and they get to actually, you know, teach p other people how to be in service, man, that's, um, Definitely. that's the work right there. That's, that's the work. For sure. So let's talk about your transition. Um, share a little bit about your story. How was, how was your transition you know, out of sport into life? Um, what are some of the things that you had to deal with? What were your learnings? What was the lessons that you got from it? Yeah, so first things first, after I finished at University of Texas at Tyler, uh, it, 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 was, it, it was a negative experience um, because I, I was injured the majority of the season. I had a stress fracture in my shin, so I was wearing a boot. And then when I finally got to come back and play, then I was so far down the depth chart, I didn't even get the opportunity to really perform. And following that, graduated, and now I'm still trying to chase my hoop dreams because I didn't get to live it out in my four years of college. And I played for a small semi-pro team where I'm, I'm working during the day and then going practicing late at night. And then I realized that this isn't what I wanna do. I wanna be, I wanna, I wanna play overseas. I wanna get paid to play. I wanted to do these things. 
uh, but those weren't opportunities that I that that I had access to at that time. So that that was one of the struggles, just trying to balance um, real life bills, just trying to balance managing day to day day to day essentials, but still. I'm taking up a lot of time by going to practice and, and doing all these other things. Right. So that, that was a struggle in itself. And, and then I had my, I had my degree in psychology and I was telling myself, well, I want to counsel people, but I can't really do much with just a bachelor's in psychology, not the way that I desired to. So I was like, Oh, I have to go back to school. Um, so I, I went, I, I went through, I went through all of that. And, and then grant, I see, and then I, then I got kicked out of grad school. Wow. Yeah, I, I got so I got kicked out of grad school um, because I because I, I plagiarized. I plagiarized on a paper um, and I got kicked out of grad school. It was a lapse uh, of integrity with, without a doubt. Um, but looking back, I mean, now I chart it up because I'm, I'm a man of faith. So I, I chalk it all up to the fact of, you know, that being another story that I can share. Should I have done it? No, I shouldn't have done it. Right. But ultimately, if I did get that degree, I don't think I would have been as happy as I am now doing this work, working with student athletes and students in this way and young professionals versus me doing the work in therapy in a counseling session, the way I initially envisioned it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, what's cool about this. And um, this is where, you know, I I got this from my, from my mentor, uh, Graham Betchar, but he has this saying, uh, victory goes to the vulnerable. And, Mm. The, so the, the, the being vulnerable with our stories, there's so much power to it. And there's so much like, it's hard to do sometimes. Like when you have to tell somebody, yeah, I plagiarized and got kicked out. That's tough. But guess what? You're going to probably save somebody from them doing that. And some of the stuff that I had to go through with my adversities, you know, um, you know, not that I fell into a life of alcohol and drugs, but when I was going when I was transitioning out of sport, I, I didn't know where I was going. I just knew that it, I, I was this like straight arrow nedge guy that everybody like had this like, you know, quarterback image of. And I'm like, I don't want that anymore. I want to be, mm. I want to be something on the other side. And I had to go into the other side to check it out. But, but that's, that was my story. Yes. I did escape a little bit with drugs. I did escape a little bit with, with, but I'm not, I'm not afraid to share that. But there was a moment in my life where I'm like, I don't know if I want to share that with people because I don't want people to start making a perception of me. But I'm like, screw it. It's my story. And I had a, and I put it in my book. So it's, it's, it's written in stone for a long time. So, um, <laughs> but I think it's just, it's, it's, I think it'd be tough. It's tough sometimes when we have a story that is powerful, but we have to allow ourselves to crack open our chest so people can actually feel it and hear it so they don't have to go through it in their mm. lives. Definitely. I mean, I, I, I agree with that a hundred, a hundred and twenty percent, uh, Grant, because, um, the same, the same for me, there were some things that I was embarrassed about and I was ashamed about. And, and, and that's why just on, on, on the, on the TEDx that I did in, at Texas A&M, I talked about the pain of an untold story and just wow. sharing my journey after barely graduating high school, barely graduating high school, getting fired from my job. And, and then there was a young lady I was dating at the time and, and then I got her pregnant and this is all a part of my story. And then as my dad and my mom, they saw the, the Ted, the TEDx and they're like, I didn't know you were going through that. <laughs> it's the first time I heard this story. And I was like, Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's definitely j- just one of those things that, that, that sometimes we have to, we, we, we have to get that scar. We have to get that cut so that ultimately the person behind us may just get bruised mm. versus them getting, getting the cut and versus them, uh, you know, having to be bandaged up and yeah. having to be broken because now they, they see our experience and they see how we ultimately navigated and now they can look at it from a different angle. For sure. You know, I want to ask this question about the, um, about your transition, the length of it. So when you, you know, you left the, you know, you left your sport, and you're dealing with all these different things, you know, you're, you're not, now you're like, now I have to be like a quote unquote normal person. Right. Like, I, yeah. I'm not <laughs> right. Yeah. So how, 
how long, like when you were dealing with that transition, because some people, it's a very short transition. They can transition into their next life, their next thing, their next role really quick. It's a smooth transition. They did things right on the front end, or they had some people around them that kind of guided them to the, in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Or there's some people like me that my transition took about two decades to kind of get over and to really uh, let go of all that the frustration and, and, and all the identity crisis and all that kind of stuff. So what, how was that transition? Was it smooth? Was it short? Like share a little bit like what, what you had to go through. De- definitely. So my, so my transition, I wouldn't necessarily call it, call it short, but, but at the same time, um, my transition after, like I said, graduating, it probably was about like a four year, four year ish transition. And so I guess I got, I got, a, I got a degree in transitioning. Um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but uh, so after, after graduating, then I went back to um, a nonprofit where I, I grew up. I used to volunteer here and yeah. I was one of the teachers for the after school program and for the summer program at one point. And then after I graduated, I came back and I was the program manager there. Mm-hmm. So I was the program manager there for about two years. And, and, and Grant, this, this was a different type of work. Because it was a nonprofit, so overwork, underpaid. Sometimes uh, my, my my colleague and I we would go to sleep at the nonprofit, so we can get up the next morning and turn in these food forms and have to. It it, it was like an ongoing fundraiser and an ongoing like Thanksgiving give back type deal. Like this was continual, and then we would do half the day's work there and spend the rest of the half day going to elementary school. And I was the program manager, so when people didn't show up, then I was reading books to pre, pre-K students. And then when those people showed up, then I was giving spelling tests to fifth graders. So I did that for about two years. Then on the other side of that, then I was doing the nonprofit, then I was doing the, um, the retail. So wow. I did the phone books, did the retail where I sold high-end jeans to high-end purses, and just doing that and then the last part of it was on the other side where i then began to uh work for an inventory company so going into stores late at night and counting the items one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so putting all that together and through the midst of this i'm just trying to discover what's next just trying to find what i'm supposed to be doing yeah uh and and the last job i had while i was still going while i was still booking speaking engagements here and Working this overnight, I was at a group home to where I worked with uh, some, some gentlemen who uh, ha- have uh, different intellectual disabilities. Uh, and I would go there at 12 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the morning. And sometimes straight from there, I'd go to a speaking engagement. So all of this was happening uh, while I was transitioning. All of this was happening while I was getting a better understanding of who I am, where can I serve. But ultimately, I feel that it's all made me better. When, it, when I come to where I am now in regards to development and being patient with individuals and being able to connect with individuals and right. teaching different styles. So four, four years in, in all of those jobs and probably some other ones that I left out, but that, wow. was, that was the extent of my transition for the most part. Well, it seems like you, you got a degree in hustling. <laughs> and you, you know, I mean, you were like working and like, you just kept it going. You kept, you, you know, that's, that's impressive, man. Thank you. But yeah, man, it was the, the, the journey wasn't the journey was not pretty the journey wasn't pretty. And of course, you know, we're, we're still just just continue to find and find ways to serve. But we're trying to focus it in, in, in this area yeah. with, with, with speaking in the workshops. And totally, totally. Well, you know, we I, I talk about this a lot on the show. We talk about the things that we get from sport, the lessons, um, mm-hmm. how, how how our characters get built and just um the beautiful things that we, we get from our sport and how we can use those attributes in life after sports. So I know mm-hmm. for me as a quarterback, I mean, the first thing that I, I take from, from what I got was leadership skills. I mean, as a quarterback, I mean, that's, you have to have that. And so, you know, being a quarterback when I was eight years old, I mean, and then throughout all the way up to my early twenties, I mean, I, I had so much runway with leadership and communication oh, wow. and connectedness and all that stuff. So, <laughs> So I know it was very easy for me to lead people when I got out of sport. So for you and what you're doing now, what are some of the things that 
that you took from your sport that's allowed you to be successful in what you're doing now? So uh, one, one for sure was, was punctuality. Our, our coach was a stickler for punctuality and, and he also held us accountable as well. So we would have to show up to 6 a.m. practices and he always made us carry these binders. And we we're like, why are you making us carry these binders? And he was just teaching us to be disciplined. He was teaching us to be accountable. Um, and also at the same time, he was making sure that we we're punctual. So those were some things uh, for sure. And, and without a doubt, character development character yeah. development at the highest level right um, because you're just helping us you know stay calm under pressure helping us understand that yeah i mean you you can play basketball a little bit you you okay you're like you're kind of good um but at the same time like what's going to be said about you after you leave after you go on what's going to be your legacy and will people remember you for for your attitude or will people remember you for you know for the positive attitude um, that you had and how you impacted people so, so th those would be some of, some of the biggest ones um, that, that, that I could say. And, and then the last part was just creating a sense of family, right? Like understanding that, that the people on your team, this is a brotherhood. The, throughout the season, you spend more time on the road. You spend more time eating meals. You spend more time in hotels with these individuals. So you should build on these relationships. Um, and I'm grateful for all of those lessons um, from the, the first coach that comes to mind is coach John Felman. And, and then there were two other coaches, Coach Chris Carter and Coach Espinosa. Um, those gentlemen at, at my junior college were uh, very pivotal in my life. And I can't forget Coach Crawford as well. He was the first coach that I was the team manager for. And oh. then I became, uh, then, I, then I hopped on the team. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you go. But you know what? It's, you know what's beautiful you just said is um, coaches, man, coaches are instrumental. Like you get a good coach, man. They are I, I, my one of my my high school coach was awesome because him and I had a really good relationship, and he trusted me a lot. But my junior college coach, who I only played for for two years, man, is Pete Davis. I mean, he the way he would talk to us, hey man, like he was just he, <laughs> he had that just presence, and he had little like zingers, little things that. But he also held himself confidently and. I don't know, man, like he taught me some cool lessons about just trusting myself and just make a choice, make mm. the choice because you don't know what's going to happen, but you, you don't, won't know until you actually make a choice and trust yourself. And then he goes, the beautiful thing about it is that if you don't do what you needed to do or, the, or you don't get the result, you learn from it. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. But you, you have to actually trust yourself first to understand the process. So I was like, wow. So he's like, so, he, you know basically told me, you know, do it. Like, so every time that I sit there and I, I'm overanalyzing, I hear Coach Davis in my ear, like, just make the decision, just go, just trust yourself. So, so yeah. it's cool that you bring up the, the importance of, of coaches. Um, so let's, let's get into your work a little bit. Um, right now, with the pandemic, there's a lot of mm. crazy things that I wouldn't even call them crazy. There's a lot of just changing things from week to week, month to month. There's just things that are changing. What are some of the things that you're seeing, like some themes that you're, you're seeing with student athletes? Um, and then if you had a message to send to student athletes during this time, what would that be? Uh, yeah. So I think right, right now, just um, some of the things I'm, I'm seeing with the student athletes, those who actively are not playing, you're, you're seeing them become a little bit disengaged in regards to the educational component. Mm. Um, because a lot of times, if, if we're honest, and I don't, I don't think it's a secret, if it's Division One all the way down to Division Three, and even across the board, the junior college as well, if students do not have their sport, a lot of times they just unplug because I'm ultimately in school to play my sport. Yeah. And I will perform in class. I will do what I have to do to make sure that I get to touch the field. Prime example, Last Chance You, which is one of my favorite shows right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, j just seeing that. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing them become disengaged. And even with this generation, I think this is a great opportunity just for mental toughness to be cultivated. And, and I say that because nobody does well if they're not used to dealing with change. And if they don't, if they don't have a, a, a coach, Pete Davis, like I believe you said, yeah. who tells you just do it or somebody who's encouraging you and somebody's letting you know that 
It might seem like the end of the world, but I promise it's not the end of the world. Yes, I know that your identity is in your sport, yeah. but let's find a way to where we can begin to tap into what, what is something else that you're a little bit passionate about? What's something else that you want to learn more about? So ultimately, my, my message to them would be find a hobby. And, and I, don't, I don't mean that in, you know, in, 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 any, in any funny way or anything like that. Yeah. But a lot of times that hobby you, we'll begin to see can turn into a passion. And that passion can eventually become what you desire to do with your life and how you desire to best serve people. So find that hobby. See, see if it turns into a passion. If not, then it's a great hobby to relieve stress for self-care. But yeah, there, there, there's definitely a lot of changes going on and we need to learn to take a break from social media as well. <laughs> no one can get up from the screen, get away from the computer, hop off Twitter, get off Instagram, but just, 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 just take a little walk around the block or, or go outside and let the sun touch your face or something. Yeah. No, I, I, that, that's a huge point because I do this a lot because I'm in front of my computer. I'm, I'm doing, sometimes I get caught into the whole social media uh, mm. tractor beam, but <laughs> nature is such a beautiful tool and it's a beautiful, like if you just go out for a walk, it's one thing to go for a walk, but put some music on. And then mm. if you just want to like literally meditate, literally, I know this is going to sound weird, but meditate on, on a tree or maybe mm. like a park and just see energy. Mm -hmm. If most people don't have, they don't have that, that capacity to slow things down. Trust mm -hmm. me, if there's enough sunlight and you're listening to music and you're feeling good, trip out a little bit on a tree. You'll see the energy and you start to realize like, wow, like you get relaxed. You're not thinking about mm -hmm. anything ne negative. You're getting grounded. It's just, it's a beautiful mm -hmm. thing. Um, if you can connect with energy. Um, I'm also going to add on to what you're saying as far as um, messaging goes during these times is, you know, you're absolutely right. I've, I've actually seen a lot of athletes unplug and get disengaged, but man, this is the time where you, you stay connected. Like you stay connected with your craft. You stay connected with the people that feed you and you feed other people. And who knows how long this, the, the effects of the pandemic is going to who knows what the new normal is going to look like yeah but i asked the question to athletes if there was an end to the pandemic mm. how would you want to see yourself at the end of it as far as all the work you've done your development things you've learned like what what does that look like and what does it feel like well, let's put some identity to it and so it makes them kind of like i don't want to get them too far out in the future but I also want to let them know that there's an opportunity for you to stay connected and it yes. looks a, a certain way and it feels a certain way. That's gold, Grant. That's, I'm, I'm going to borrow that question from you. I'm going to let you know I'm borrow that question. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, beautiful. Well, man, what, how can my, my listeners connect with you, learn about, I mean, you have books and podcasts and you're speaking, TED Talks, you have all this stuff going on. How, how can they get connected and learn more about you? Definitely. So the, the, the best place to find me is just jonathanjonespeaks.com. Um, and then if you type that just on Google, or if you type in Jonathan J speaks on, on any platform, I, I should come up. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's where, you know, they can, um, they, they can find my podcast on the website. Uh, people can see about booking me on the website. And even in addition to that, they, they can get a free chapter of my book just by way of my, my website. So uh, we have all the resources and things like that on the website. And and thank you for just the opportunity to share, Grant. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's a question that I usually ask before I actually have you share uh, all your handles and websites and stuff. And, and I, and I want to make sure that I ask this question because I think it's, it's a part of reflection. And I, I think when we reflect, this is how we grow. Mm -hmm. um, and considering all the things you've gone through um, in your life and what you have done for student athletes at all levels, when you reflect on your whole career, everything as an athlete, as an entrepreneur, what do you think you've learned the most about yourself? I realized that perspective drives performance. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I, and I want to I expound a little bit on that because in the earlier years of my life, I had a negative perspective and that drove my performance in a very, very negative way. I was negatively um, saying things to colleagues. I was negatively 
uh, just impacted my own life. I had negative habits, negative behaviors. But since my perspective has been shifted positively, now I'm realizing that nothing is, nothing is out of my reach. I, I, I don't believe anything is truly impossible. Um, so, so perspective drives performance. And, 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 I, and I, wanna, I wanna challenge everybody on that. I wanna, I wanna challenge everybody just to just ask yourself, like right now, what is my perspective? And then yeah. by following that, then, then you can ask, based on this perspective, what is possible? Yeah. You know, there's um, a couple years ago, um, when you think about perspective, there was a, another mm. word or words that someone shared with me. It's called your internal representation. Mm. That's your perspective. And that's your truth. So, you know, what do you want your truth to be? What do you want your internal representation to be when you're, when you're not playing enough minutes or when you're not starting? Does it have mm. to be actually a negative experience? You know, so it doesn't have to be. There's a lot of things we can do to shift and reframe. Um, so I, I love that how you bring up how perspectives drives performance because you have a choice. No one actually makes your perspective. It's yours. Like mm -hmm. you own it. You create it. You're the filmmaker of it. So, so let's, let's actually like, let's check it out a little bit. Let's actually reframe it and let's actually make it more grander or whatever, whatever it is. But let's, let's, let's be an artist with it. Definitely. I mean, because we, we, we all do have a blank every day. We start off with a blank canvas every, yep. every single day. Yep. What are you going to put on it? What are you going to paint? Exactly. Exactly. Jonathan, this was, uh, this was awesome, man. This is uh this was a treat to have you on my show and, and thank you for, for your energy and sharing your mindset and your journey and, and what you're doing for student athletes, man. This is, this is a perfect time for you to step up in the light and, and, and help young athletes. So uh, I appreciate everything you're doing, man. Grant, I definitely appreciate you and the work that you're doing to cultivate minds all across the globe. So thank you for the opportunity.